Day 449 Sunday, June 23, 2 Kings 15 29 31, 38, 2 Kings 16, 6 18, 2 Kings 17, 1 2, 1 Chronicles 5 23 26 and 2 Chronicles 27, 9, 2 Kings 15 29 31, 38 NKJV In the days of Pekah king of Israel, Tiglath Pileser king of Assyria came and took Ijan, Abel Beth Macha, Genoa, Kedesh, Hazar, Gilead, and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and he carried them captive to Assyria. Then Hashiah the son of Elah led a conspiracy against Pekah the son of Remaliah, and struck and killed him. So he reigned in his place in the twentieth year of Jotham the son of Isaiah. Now the rest of the acts of Pekah, and all that he did, indeed they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. So Jotham rested with his fathers, and was buried with his fathers in the city of David his father. Then Ahaz his son reigned in his place 2 Kings 16, 618 and KJV 8 that time Razin king of Syria captured Elath for Syria, and drove the men of Judah from Elath. Then the Edomites went to Elath, and dwell there to this day. So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath Pileser king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son, come up and save me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel, who rise up against me. Dot. And Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord, and in the treasuries of the king's house, and sent it as a present to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria heeded him, for the king of Assyria went up against Damascus and took it, carried its people captive to Kir, and killed Razin. Now king Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath Pileser king of Assyria, and saw an altar that was at Damascus. And king Ahaz sent to Uriah the priest the design of the altar and its pattern, according to all its workmanship. Then Uriah the priest built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Uriah the priest made it before King Ahaz came back from Damascus. And when the king came back from Damascus, the king saw the altar, and the king approached the altar and made offerings on it. So he burned his burnt offering and his grain offering, and he poured his drink offering and sprinkled the blood of his peace offerings on the altar. He also brought the bronze altar which was before the Lord, from the front of the temple from between the new altar and the house of the Lord, and put it on the north side of the new altar. Then King Ahaz commanded Uriah the priest, saying, On the great new altar burn the morning burnt offering, the evening grain offering, the king's burnt sacrifice, and his grain offering, with the burnt offering of all the people of the land, their grain offering, and their drink offerings, and sprinkle on it all the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice, and the bronze altar shall be for me to inquire by. Dot. Thus did Uriah the priest, according to all that King Ahaz commanded. And King Ahaz cut off the panels of the carts, and removed the lavers from them. And he took down the sea from the bronze oxen that were under it, and put it on a pavement of stones. Also he removed the Sabbath pavilion which they had built in the temple. And he removed the king's outer entrance from the house of the Lord, on account of the king of Assyria. 2 Kings 17, 1 2 NKJV in the twelfth year of Ahaz king of Judah. Hashiah the son of Elah became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned nine years, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel who were before him. 1 Chronicles 5 23 26 NKJV So the children of the half-tribe of Manasseh dwelt in the land. Their numbers increased from Bashan to Baal Hermon, that is, to Senir, or Mount Hermon. These were the heads of their fathers' houses, Ephor, Ishi, Eliel, Azrael, Jeremiah, Hadaviah, and Jadiel. They were mighty men of valor, famous men, and heads of their fathers' houses. And they were unfaithful to the God of their fathers, and played the harlot after the gods of the peoples of the land, whom God had destroyed before them. So the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul king of Assyria, that is, Tiglath Pileser king of Assyria. He carried the Reubenites, the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh into captivity. He took them to Hala, Haber, Hara and the river of Gazan to this day 2 Chronicles 27, 9 NKJV So Jotham rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. Then Ahaz his son reigned in his place. Daily Deep Dive The UCG reading plan states, We learned at the beginning of Isaiah's prophecy to Ahaz that Pekah and Razin would not succeed in overthrowing the Jewish king. Isaiah 7, 7 But it turned out far worse for them than that. Syria managed to expel the Jews from Elath in the south of Judah on the Gulf of Aqaba, enabling Edomite raiders to take it over. But thereafter Syria was doomed. God had said through Isaiah that Assyria would destroy Israel and Syria. Perhaps this encouraged Ahaz to make another appeal to Tiglath Pileser III. If so, it was superstition rather than trust in God. For if he had trusted in God, 
he would have made no appeal to Assyria at all, particularly when Isaiah had warned that Assyria was a threat to Judah as well. Again he sends tribute, and this time Assyria helps him, but it would have happened anyway, as God had already ordained it. In 733 BC Tiglath-Pileser made the second offensive thrust of his second western campaign, and he made a third and final thrust the next year, in 732. In these two invasions, Israel and Syria suffered terrible defeat, with most of their populations being carried away captive. It was ancient practice, by empires such as Assyria to deport large numbers of influential citizens of a conquered country or city to decrease the possibility of rebellion. C. 2 Kings. 25 hours, and 11 minutes, 12, Ezek 1, 2, 3, Nelson Study Bible, note on 2 Kings 17, 5, 6, based on the locations given in 2 Kings 15, 29, likely the record of the 733 campaign, this first of Israel's two national captivities, the second came a decade later, is known as the Galilean captivity, it involved massive deportation over a huge area, from Galilee, the plain of Sharon to the west, and, as shown in 1 Chronicles 5:26, likely the record of the 732 campaign, territory across the Jordan to the east. In fact, this was around three-fourths of the territory of the northern kingdom, so that only a small rump state around the capital city, Samaria, remained intact, stated to Glyph-Pileser in his records. Bet Omri that is, the house of Omri, the Assyrian name for Israel, all of whose cities I had added to my territories on the former campaigns and had left out only the city of Samaria, the whole of Naphtali I took for Assyria, I put my officials over them as governors, the land of Beth Omri, all its people and their possessions I took away to Assyria, the account in 1 Chronicles 5 states that the deported Israelites were taken to Hala, Haber, Hara, and the river of Gazan, verse 26, these places were located in Assyria in northern Mesopotamia, in what is now southeast Turkey, northeast Syria and northern Iraq, See Yohanan Aharani and Michael Avi Yuna, The Macmillan Bible Atlas, 1977, pages 96-97. In fact, scholars identify Hara as Haran, the city in which Abraham dwelt and where most of his family remained, also where Isaac's wife Rebecca came from and where Jacob lived, married and fathered his sons before God sent him back to the Promised Land. So when God expelled the Israelites from the Promised Land, he sent them back to the land from where their forebears had come. This then, was the beginning of the end for Israel, and it was the end for Pekah and Razin, for in 732 BC both rulers were killed. In fact, Tiglath-Pileser's campaign seems to have spawned a pro-Assyrian faction in Israel, of the mentality that says, I want to be on the winning side, whichever side that is. It was in this way that Pekah was assassinated and replaced by Hashia. The new usurper apparently received some encouragement, and possibly help, in the deed. Tiglath-Pileser's annals record, they, the Israelites overthrew their king Pekah and I placed Hosea as king over them, quoted by Wilson, the Bible is history, page 155, the northern kingdom, or what was left of it, was now on its last legs, in Judah, Ahaz's apostasy only worsened, instead of acknowledging God for the overthrow of his enemies, Ahaz presented himself before the Assyrian king in Damascus as a tributary subject, and while there, he sent instructions home to Jerusalem for building a replica of an impressive pagan altar he saw in the Syrian capital to replace the bronze altar at the Temple of God. God's altar is then shoved aside, and the pagan altar put in its place. Yes, even after Syria's defeat at the hands of Assyria, these and many other activities continued to provoke God to anger, and eventually helped to bring about the destruction of the Jewish nation. During all these events, Jotham, Ahaz's father, has apparently remained alive as we see that Hashia replaces Pekah during Jotham's 20th year, 2 Kings 15:30. However, this is four years beyond Jotham's 16-year reign. Verse 33. Evidently Jotham had abdicated in favor of his son four years prior. Perhaps he was infirm and unable to govern. He may even have been isolated and unaware of the troubles of the kingdom. Or perhaps, though weakened and powerless, he was teaching Ahaz's son Hezekiah, his grandson, the need to turn the nation back to the true God. In any case, Jotham likely died soon after the events we just read about, as there is no indication he is around three years later when Hezekiah becomes corrigent and the record of his death mentions only Ahaz reigning in his place. Comet and 2 Kings 16, verse 18 The Adam Clark's commentary states, There are a great number of conjectures concerning this covert, or, as it is in the Hebrew, 
the musage, of the Sabbath, as the word, and others derived from the same root, signify covering or booths, it is, very likely that this means either a sort of canopy which was erected on the Sabbath days for the accommodation of the people who came to worship, and which Ahaz took away to discourage them from that worship, or a canopy under which the king and his family reposed themselves and which he transported to some other place to accommodate the king of Assyria when he visited him. Jarki supposes that it was a sort of covert way that the kings of Judah had to the temple, and Ahaz had it removed lest the king of Assyria, going by that way, and seeing the sacred vessels, should covet them. If that way had been open, he might have gone by it into the temple, and have seen the sacred vessels, and so have asked them from a man who was in no condition to refuse them, however unwilling he might be to give them up. The removing of this, whatever it was, whether throne or canopy, or covered way, cut off the communication between the king's house and the temple, and the king of Assyria would not attempt to go into that sacred place by that other passage to which the priests alone had access, comment and, 